Welcome to your online class. This week we're going to be discussing vital signs. Please review the following learning objectives for Lesson 7.1 on vital signs. There are four main vital signs. These include temperature, pulse, respiration, and blood pressure. These signs are the human body's indicators of eternal hemostasis and the patient's general state of health. Because medical assistants are chiefly responsible for obtaining these measurements, it's imperative that they have confidence in the theoretic and practical applications of vital sign measurement. Vital signs are influenced by many factors, both physical and emotional, and it's important to be aware of this fact. We will also discuss during class that we can consider height and weight, as well as pain level, other vital signs. Body temperature is defined as the balance between heat loss and heat produced by the body. The temperature of younger children fl fluctuates due to external factors, and older individuals lose ability to respond therapeutically to temperature extremes. Factors affecting body temperature can be age, stress and physical activity, gender, and other external factors. Fever can be continuous, intermittent, or remittent. Continuous fevers stay above the normal range but fluctuate three degrees or less. Intermittent fevers come and go, alternating between elevated and normal temperatures, and remittent fevers fluctuate considerably and never return to the normal range. As you can see from this chart, average body temperatures are different for various age groups. If the ambulatory care setting where you work uses a Celsius thermometer, Patients may ask you what the temperature is in Fahrenheit degrees because that is the scale that they understand. When recording on your chart, you should write a capital T for tympanic, a capital A for axillary, or a capital TA for temporal artery readings after recording the temperature to clarify that an alternate site was used. For patients younger than three years old, or for those unable to hold the thermometer properly in their mouth during the procedure, a tympanic or temporal thermometer can be used. This chart shows the various ways to obtain a temperature reading for an adult, and it also shows the average adult temperatures in Fahrenheit and Celsius. The Fahrenheit scale is used most often in the United States, but hospitals and many ambulatory care settings use the Celsius scale. It is important to understand the conversion of each temperature, and we will discuss this further in class. A digital thermometer, as shown in figure 7-1, beeps when the process is complete. This usually takes about 10 to 60 seconds, and the reading appears on the LED screen on the face of the instrument. Uh, speed and comfort of a tympanic thermometer has greatly influenced its popularity, but in certain cases should not be used, such as a bilateral otitis externa or impacted cerumen is present in both ears. Figure 7-3 shows the temporal artery scanner, which uses an infrared beam to assess the temperature of the blood flowing through the temporal artery of the lateral forehead. This is commonly used in the pediatric department. Axillary temperatures take more time to register the correct body temperature, but the method is safe, simple, and easy to perform. The two types of disposable thermometers are the one placed under the tongue and the one placed on the forehead. One example is shown in figure 7-4. If a chance exists that a patient's body fluid touched the digital thermometer, wipe it with disinfectant before returning it to the storage area. For tympanic thermometers, be careful not to get the tip of the probe surface wet and always use probe covers because disinfectant can ruin the probe surface. 
This figure shows the pulse sites. The carotid artery is most commonly used in emergencies to check the pulse during CPR. The brachial pulse is the artery that is felt and heard when a blood pressure is measured. The characteristics of a pulse are measured by rate, rhythm, and volume. Because the body must balance heat loss by increasing circulation, the pulse rate is proportionate with the size of the heart. What causes various pulse rates? Pulse rates normally vary as a result of a person's age, body size, gender, and health status. An abnormal rhythm or arrhythmia is described according to the rhythm pattern detected. An intermittent pulse may occur in healthy individuals during exercise or after drinking a beverage containing caffeine. This table shows approximate age-related pulse ranges. The force of each pulse beat is described as bounding or full, strong or normal, or thready or weak. The pulse force is measured using a three-point scale that you can view on this slide. Figure 710 shows a Doppler ultrasound unit used to measure the pedal pulse. Too much pressure obliterates the patient's pulse and too little pressure prevents detection of irregularities of all of the beats. A Doppler unit, which is an ultrasound unit that magnifies the pulsation, may be used to locate and count these pulses accurately. What is the purpose of respiration? The purpose of respiration is to provide for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide among the atmosphere, the blood, and the body cells. Internal respiration occurs at the cellular level when oxygen in the bloodstream is transferred into the cells for energy and carbon dioxide is released as a waste product and transported back to the lungs for exhalation. Respiration characteristics can be normal, rapid, or slow. Dyspenia occurs in patients with pneumonia, asthma, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or also known as COPD, and after physical exertion, or very high altitudes. Other alterations in breathing are bradypenia, apnea, tachypenia, and hyperpenia. This table shows the approximate age-related respiration ranges. What are some things considered normal concerning rhythm? Automatic interruptions, such as sighing, are considered normal. Noticeable breath sounds are a sign of certain diseases, such as pneumonia, asthma, or pulmonary edema. When counting respirations, don't mention your counting to the patient. This can change the patient's rate of breathing and respiration. Count for 30 seconds and multiply by two and record variations on the patient's chart. Keep your eyes alternately on the patient's chest and you watch while you count the pulse rate. And then without removing your fingers from the pulse site, determine the respiratory rate. Do not use the 15 second interval because this count can vary by a factor of plus four or minus four, which is a significant uh, difference when dealing with such a small number. Procedure 7-6 describes how to access the patient's radial pulse and respiratory rate. Blood pressure. The systolic pressure is the highest pressure level that occurs when the heart is contracting and the first pulse beat is heard. The diastolic pressure is the lowest pressure level when the heart is relaxed and the last sound is heard. The difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure is the pulse pressure. The blood pressure is recorded as a fraction with the systolic reading, the numerator, on the top and the diastolic reading, or the denominator, on the bottom. Here are the approximate age-related blood pressure ranges. An increased blood volume raises the blood pressure, 
and a decreased blood volume lowers the blood pressure. The peripheral resistance of blood vessels refers to the relationship of the lumen, which is the diameter of the vessel, to the amount of blood flowing through it. The smaller the lumen, the greater the resistance of blood flow. With age, lifestyle factors, or the presence of arterial sclerosis, vessels elasticity may decrease, causing the arterial walls to become firm and resistant. As a result, the blood pressure increases. If the myocardium becomes weak, pressure in the vessels begin to increase in the attempt to maintain an adequate level of circulating blood to meet the oxygen and nutrient needs of the body. Temporary hypertension may occur with stress, pain, exercise, and exhaustion. Essential hypertension has no single identified cause, but is associated with obesity, a high blood level of sodium, elevated cholesterol levels, and family history. Primary hypertension is diagnosed if the patient's blood pressure is persistently higher than 119 over 79 at two or more office visits over several weeks or a month. The American Heart Association guidelines recognizes three stages. There's prehypertension, stage one hypertension, and stage two hypertension. The guidelines state that lifestyle changes before medical treatment should be tried. If you're over the age of 50, should be treated for a systolic greater than 140. Blood pressure medications can be used and a patient-centered treatment. What is the goal of these guidelines? The goal of the new recommendations is to reduce the number of people who die each year from hypertension-related illness such as coronary artery disease, heart attack, heart failure, kidney disease, and stroke. Who is the greatest at risk for hypertension? People of African-American descent, middle-aged and elderly people, patients with diabetes mellitus, and those with kidney disease. This chart shows stages and treatment of hypertension. Also note that hypotension exists, which means abnormally low blood pressure. A sphygmomanometer is used to measure blood pressure. It is important that it be regularly recalibrated and checked for accuracy and must be used with a stethoscope. The needle on the abnormal dial sphygmomanometer should rest within the small square or circle at the bottom of the dial. The dial can be calibrated by connecting it to the calibrated manometer. If you have a patient who you are monitoring their pressure at home, be sure that they understand the mechanics of obtaining a reading accurately. Procedure 77 describes how to determine a patient's blood pressure. It is important to use the proper blood pressure cuff size when measuring blood pressure. You can get inaccurate readings if the cuff sizes are not correct. For example, if the cuff is too small, you may have an inaccurately high reading, and if the cuff is too large, you may have an inaccurately low reading. The arm should be placed at the level of the heart on a table next to an examination room chair or resting on the arm of the chair to ensure an accurate reading. The systolic pressure may be checked by feeling the radial pulse rather than hearing it with the stethoscope. Place the cuff in the usual position and palpate the radial pulse, noting rate and rhythm. Inflate the cuff until the pulse disappears and then add 30 mmHgs of inflation to get above the systolic pressure. Do not remove your fingers from the pulse or change the pressure of your fingers. This method can be very useful in times of medical emergency, such as shock when the patient's blood pressure cannot be oscillated. As stated earlier, a patient's anthropometric measurements can be added to the four main vital signs. The anthropometric measurements 
are the study of human body measurements, especially on a comparative basis. If this is the patient's first visit, anthropometric measurements are written in the history database and are used as a reference information during future visits as needed. What are some of the diseases that require weight monitoring? Hormone disorders, such as diabetes, growth patterns, as seen in children, and eating disorders, for example, obesity or bulimia, require accurate weight checks as part of every medical visit. When patients are unstable, assist them onto the scale and help them balance themselves. Here is the mathematical equation for converting kilograms to pounds. We will practice this in class. If the physician prescribes weight measurement at home, make sure the patient understands the importance of weighing himself or herself each day at the same time in clothing or similar weight. Here are some of the ways that medical assistants provide patient education in relation to vital signs. Accurate and safe thermometer use, obtaining pulse, tracking respirations, measuring blood pressure, and weight management. Use diagrams to teach pulse points and have the patients measure your pulse to assess the patient's accuracy and to provide any needed assistance. The patient and all caregivers also should be taught self-assessment if impending complications and how to perform preventative breathing exercises. Have an assortment of weight management literature available for the patient to take home and use community resources when indicated to help the patient with weight-related issues. Here are the responsibilities of the medical assistant in obtaining vital signs. Legal and ethical considerations. It is important to know that a medical assistant is not qualified to diagnose patients, and a medical assistant must always function within the legal boundaries of the profession. It is key that you know your scope of practice and everything that goes along with that. Always be accurate in transcribing results into the patient's health record. A careless attitude towards assessment of vital signs and documentation can lead to possible legal entanglement. Remember, if no entry is made, the assumption is that the procedure was not done. That concludes our lecture on vital signs. I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday and please bring any questions you have with you. Bye-bye.